right. Oh, where am I? Why am I not in the screen? That is fantastic. Hey, what's up, everybody? Uh, welcome to the podcast live. Uh, today is Thursday, the 16th of November. I can't believe we're even here, but let me welcome my guest. Let's bring him on, Mr. Jason O'Mara. Jason, welcome to the show. Thanks, Adam. Thanks. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for joining us today. And for everybody who's not familiar, my guest today on the podcast is Jason O'Mara. Jason is an Irish actor currently living in L.A. And after a period of starting his career in Dublin and then London and working in some of Britain's finest theaters, Jason came to the U.S. to exploit everything here, take all of our money and women. No, I'm just kidding. Correct. Um, yeah. correct. Uh, you might recognize his younger face from one of my favorite shows of all time, uh, HBO Band of Brothers. Uh, since then, it's become a... Prem, uh, a presence on American and international screens, both big and small. Nominated for three IFTA awards in 2023 for Smother, 2018 for Marvel's Agents of the Shield, great show, and winning the IFTA for Best Supporting Actor in 2017 for his role in the Siege of Jadaville. I've, I've not, I've not seen that one. I think I need to. What's what's that? That's one an about? interesting. Yeah, that's a good one. That's that was that's on Netflix, um, and it's about the only Irish foreign Irish conflict in the 20th century in uh, the Congo. That's an interesting one. We're going to have to check that out. And for anyone with kids out there or or are um, DC fans, he voices uh, Batman in the original animated movies and Zeus in Netflix's animated hit show, Blood of Zeus. Uh, he's an ambassador to Movember, uh, something that is near and dear to my heart, and I'll get that into in a little bit. And we're going to talk yeah. about his own journeys through mental health and sobriety. So let's get into it. Oh, wait, wait a minute. I, I hear you have a new movie out. What's what's that all about? Your Lucky Day oh. is out. It came out last week in theaters and yeah. on digital. Uh, we're going to get into that. Jason, officially, welcome to the podcast, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you for that introduction. Wow, that was uh, uh, almost embarrassing with the no. uh, law plaudits you were laying on me. Thank you. I, I don't think that gets old. All right, so before I get into your history, I, there's a question that I need to ask you. So um, do you watch Yellowstone? I, I I know of Yellowstone. I find it hard to watch because there was a part on it I really wanted and I didn't get. This is the problem with actors, you see. We can't watch the things that we didn't get jobs in. Well, some of us. And some of, sometimes I'm in a generous mood and I'm like, yeah, I'll watch your show even though I'm not a part of it. But yes, I know Yellowstone. Sorry. I, I, so so one, one of our, there, there's two characters in there that we love, Rip and Beth. And, and I found out that Beth is an Australian actress and it got my wife and I to talking. Why do so many actors and actresses from outside of the States come over here and they do these American accents. Do we not have enough good actors here in the States? You'd think, I mean, I, <laughs> I think you do, uh, but there seems to be, uh, there seems to be some sort of uh, supply demand thing, some sort of uh, vacuum that we're able to, to fill. I don't know what it is. Um, I, I remember 20 years ago coming over when I first came over and Casting directors would say things like, we like Irish and Australian actors because they bring this kind of sense that they've uh, lived. And I think their concern at the time, and I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's, it's that case anymore, was that um, there were some uh, American actors and actresses who were uh, too kind of maybe um, mollycoddled or to, you know, uh, I suppose you could put it down to air conditioning, uh, too much air conditioning, and, too much uh, air conditioning. And so, and so we had a kind of more of an outdoorsy, you know, edgier feel, maybe, but is I it, don't think that's true anymore. Is, 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 it, is it hard to turn the American accent on or are you turning certain elements of your accent off? How does that work from a technical no, it's, perspective? It's, it's definitely something. Well, look, my accent has morphed over the years because I lived in London you know, for eight years before I came to the States. And then when I was in the States, I lived on the East Coast for eight years and so on. So my accent's all over the place. But uh, no, it's definitely, I mean, if, I, if, I'm doing, um, if I'm doing an American accent for a character, it's definitely something um, deliberate, you know? And, and oftentimes I'll have to break down uh, the vowels and the consonants and through repetition and drilling, get the sound right. So you kind of have to start at the beginning. So talk, talk us through, because I, I, mean, I don't even have this written down, but I'm curious. Ha, ha, get us to the point of your voice now to Batman. <laughs> to Batman. <laughs> well, first of all, uh, from, from my voice to Batman. That sounds like a good, uh, uh, a good a reality talk. show. Um, yeah, reality That's your show. TED Talk. Wait, welcome to Jason O'Mara's <laughs> TED Talk. That's right. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, yeah, so... Well, first of all, there are certain sounds that you have to be careful of um, with an Irish accent in particular. And every accent has its pitfalls, but uh, an Irish accent is quite light on L's. So we say light and million and um, uh, flirt 
where whether as uh, Americans will say flirt, million, mm -hmm. light. So it's a darker L. It happens at the back of the mouth. So um, that's one word actually I have problems with. So you mm -hmm. guys say mil million, right? Million? Mil million. Million. One million, million listeners. One well, million, do one say, million dollars. Yeah. One, well, yeah, well, <laughs> we would say one million dollars. So <laughs> um, it's, 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 the, the L is lighter. So you have to kind of look out for things. Like, also, um, you know, sometimes we have like a sibilant T, like light, bright, fight. And uh, so we have to, we have to put a, usually a glottal stop on that. So fight, light, height, bright, you know, um, and so it's, it's things like that this to it yeah exactly also use like we go we go uh under uh blood under. you know that kind of sound so we Off. have to open those up like blood under you know they're they're more of an open uh vowel sound so um obviously there's loads more but i would have to for batman i would have to take all of that and then uh sort of bring it down to a, a, a very quite a narrow vocal range because batman you know when he's bruce rain bruce Wayne, he has a wider kind of a range but as batman it's pretty narrow um it's it's very direct it's usually very short you know so it's i'm batman it's punchy robin wait lantern come to the back cave <laughs> come to the back cave i got back yeah. <laughs> No, I, I absolutely love it. So let me, let me ask you this. And, and you've talked about it, obviously, a lot in your interviews, but where your passion for acting came. But when it comes to voices, did you pick up any of that growing up as, as a lover of Star Wars and, and some of the Kubrick yeah. movies? Yeah. In fact, I used to I used to uh, sort of as a child, once I figured out how to record onto um, onto tape, you know, like magnetic tape, uh, audio tape, I would uh, act out you know, scenes from Star Wars, myself doing all the voices and all the sounds. Um, and when I was playing with my Star Wars figures, I would act out entire plays and movies. And uh, and then with my son, I would do that also with his toys and him. He always got a kick it. out of that. And one of the things we would play is Batman. And so when I got the actual, uh, and I was highly influenced, obviously, by Kevin Conroy. And so when I got the an opportunity to play the role, it was literally like, Oh my gosh, you know, what a wonderful crossover where I, I bring my dad in to this Batman you know, role. And what sets my Batman apart is that he's a father to Damien. So um, it was this fantastic sort of fusion of uh, life and art and... It all it all comes full circle, but let's let's talk about where it started. And people have this this conception of a, of a struggling actor. Um, out there what was what was your journey like and 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 paying your dues and you know all these kind of gigs here and there and, and and wacky commercials tell tell us your journey <laughs> well i uh i i played a waiter my first job in london when i when i moved there uh i played a waiter so i didn't have to be one in real life um, that's a good idea uh you know so that was that was kind of the first you know theater job i took so that i could um make ends meet it wasn't a great role but then um i i also did uh, the crossword results hotlines um with for five pounds an hour i'm not and, familiar with that over here well in the 90s you well, might like a help 90s. like a help like a help desk for crosswords is that what it was well, in the newspaper they would publish the crossword right. right and for the answers you would have to call a number and on the number would be a guy going hello and welcome to the daily whatever express uh, results hotline. Here is the answers for all of the down clues. One, zebra, Z, A, B, R, A, whatever. So, um, all day, <laughs> all day. I would do that all day and I would come away with whatever, what? 50 quid for the day. And I was very happy. You were, you, you were happy with that. So, so what was your, what was your breakout role? Well, I, I did a season of plays in, uh, Harrogate theater, which was followed by, um, uh, a BBC series called Barclay Square, which I did with my good friend, Victoria Smurf. We met on that and uh, she's an actress and we've been friends ever since. And that was, I think that was probably my first leading role on TV. I was very nervous for the audition. I thought I'm going to blow this with my nerves, but I managed to just hold it together. And it was one of many series that I would do that wouldn't be picked up and mm. go to a second season. But it was just enough to kind of get my foot on the rung of the ladder. 
was but let's let's talk about the struggles what what's what's uh one of those gigs that you uh kind of hope just stays in the archives buried somewhere was it a commercial was it some uh, weird kind of amateur adult film kind of stuff but i mean you got <laughs> you got the mustache now and for everyone out there that is not a porn stash that is from november we're going to get into that in a minute i'm doing mine a little bit differently <laughs> right. we'll get into it i'm you know i got i got it going on but we'll get there yeah, so, yeah, well, yeah. everyone has those roles those I, I did it for money i did it for the money <laughs> yeah there's look I could argue that I've done loads of those <laughs> and I should be more ashamed of them. <laughs> but I, uh, I, I suppose there are a few that look, there are a few that really underperformed. Like I did a, I did a movie called one for the money with Catherine Heigl and mm. like the critics hated it. It's one of the lowest movies on rotten tomatoes. Is that, is that because of the actual movie itself or for the reputation that Catherine has? And please tell us. I have us. no idea. I have no idea. And I'm, I, I'm not going to say anything about that, but um, I, 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 I really think they're a little harsh on it. It was a, it was a cute movie and, and some people have seen it and actually have really enjoyed it. So um, I don't think the critics were entirely right with that one. So, so no, I'm mm. not completely ashamed of that. I did an episode of uh, criminal minds once and looking back, Maybe, you know, maybe you shouldn't have done that one. Were, were, were you just the, the dead person under the sheet? Did you no, die in that movie? Worse. No, it's a lot <laughs> worse, Adam. Keep going. Uh, <laughs> you, you were, you were, I, uh, yeah, you did something. You were the killer. What did you do it in that one? sex. Ah, yeah. With dead people. Oh, a little, uh, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, we're yeah. going to, we're 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 going to leave that one there. Uh, <laughs> in the, in the sound. We're going to, we're going to, we're, we're going to, yeah. asking the questions. I'm giving you the answers. I, I, I am. Wait, so, so but let me ask you a question. You've died in, in movies and shows before, right? Mm -hmm. How do they coach you? How does that process even work? I'm trying to be, not to be morbid now, but while we're on necrophilia, let's just get into it. Um, <laughs> how, how do you, it took me like a minute or two to remember that big word from my, my dictionary. It's a good word. I mean, what's that process like? What's what process like? Dying on film. Uh, I'm asking all the questions I've always wanted to ask. It's not, nothing it's even actually, I've written down here. Nothing I've written down. First of all, I actually, I actually, a good death on film. There's nothing better. Like it's, it's, it's one of the great things to do as an actor. You know, I had a glorious Tell death us. as, uh, as the Patriot in Marvel's Agents of Shield, and everyone's, you know, the whole cast is crying, and everyone at home watching is crying, and you're just like, yes, this is fantastic. Jeez. Um, but other than that, um, it's it's kind of I tell you what, it's a lot easier to die on film and television than it is to die on stage because you you know you heard that expression corpsing. Uh, no, I have not. Please elaborate. So it, corpsing is is a is a theater expression, and it's what happens when you start laughing uncontrollably oh, no. on the stage, oh, right? No. And uh, it's like when you're. Oh no! And you, you know, have to hold it in. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, like a mouth, like a mouth fart. Cool. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that kind of stuff when you're like. Oh God, <clears throat> I can't laugh now, but I have to laugh. Well, that, that term comes from um, dead people on stage starting to laugh and you can see the bodies kind of, you know, vibrating, oh, no. um, laughing. <laughs> they're corpses, but they're not. So it's called corpsing, right? So um, it's, that's probably harder to die on a theater stage, especially deep into a run and stay absolutely still without laughing. It's way harder than doing it once or twice on film and TV. The problem with film and TV is, yeah, once you're dead, you sometimes have to lie there for days while the rest of the cast come along and inspect the body and the blood splatters. There's and a lot going you're on. You're just lying there. there dead for days. All right? You know? Can someone can someone give me a water while I'm lying down here? Oh yeah, yeah. You in a little part. Water and yeah, I need to there's check a, my emails. There's no bath. There's yeah. no bathroom breaks on that. So so thank you for giving us a little inside the actor's studio uh, on, on that one. Before I get to the the current work that you're doing right now in November, is there um the what's the role that got away from you? The big one. Maybe it was a big one. Like, did you lose to 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 Kevin Costner and something? Like what I'm still on a Yellowstone kick, sorry. <laughs> Kevin Costner wouldn't be one of my no. one of my uh not, um, not, not, not in the right age bracket on that one no not quite um okay so i was in in summer of 2009 i was about to start shooting a series called life on mars with harvey keitel and uh it was a remake of a bbc version which was also uh, we were also reshooting a pilot that, that we'd done with um uh david e kelly and tommy shlami the previous year and it was interrupted by the writer strike in 2007 
Um, and we were coming back to shoot um, Life on Mars. And I got a phone call from a friend of mine, director friend of mine called Rob Bowman, who was about to shoot a uh, presentation, which is half a pilot for a little show called Castle. And he was asking me if I was, uh, if I was available. And um, I said, no, I'm about to shoot Life on Mars, I'm sorry. Uh, I hope I'm not betraying Rob here, but, um, but anyway, um, I said, listening. no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I can't, I'm, I'm doing this other thing. And I, I, and I didn't know what Castle was, but I thought, kind of like with Grey's Anatomy, I thought, ah, that'll never be a hit. <laughs> it's, all, it's only been on my entire adult life, right? Yeah, so I was unavailable. And guess what? Um, the right guy got, did it in the end, Nathan Fillion, and it ran for years, and they had huge success, and good for them, Adam. Absolutely, and I got to ask you about Band of Brothers, too. You were, you were only in a handful of episodes. Um, but what was yeah, that experience? Yeah, first two. I mean that that I mean well the ensemble cast was was for the entire series but that was quite a production. Did you know what you were getting yourself into that that would be such an iconic? I put that up there in my top ten of of all time shows. Did you, did you know at the time from reading the script and and the treatment and everything? You know, it was one of those rare things that because because usually usually you 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 you'll start a film or a television project and you hope that it will turn out great or that somehow along the way, you know, you'll all figure it out and um, it'll be special. That one was special from the very beginning. It was special even when they were auditioning, you know. Um, there, there's a really good uh, podcast actually called uh, Dead Eyes about one actor's uh, experience during the casting process of Band of Brothers. And it was different and difficult for all of us in different ways. Um, but it was special even then. Everybody wanted to be a part of it. And then when we were shooting it on set, we realized how important it was. We had the C-47s there. We had the big map of Normandy uh, <clears throat> with excellent young actors, like probably the, Dave, some of the greatest actors. Damian Lewis, Ron Livingston, Michael yeah. Fassbender, David Schwimmer, Tom, young Tom Hardy, Simon yeah. Pegg, just to name a few. I mean, that was a cast. Yeah, yeah it was crazy. It was a crazy cast. But everybody it was like it was weird it was like we knew it was going to be important even when we were making it and uh there was a, a level of commitment that i think got a, a sort of a career best performance from all of these guys and it's no wonder that it started so many of their careers kept so, you know kick-started so many of them and i suppose including mine and uh, even though i had a relatively small part i realized that some of those guys were on that for months and didn't have a huge amount of lines in the end when all was said and done. And I had this great speech, you know, at the beginning about D-Day and everything. So it was it was a really special experience. I came in, I was done in a couple of weeks, but, you know, I was told by the webbing guys, they're the guys that do all the sort of the, the military, you know, the webbing, the pockets and the, the props and the, you know, ammunition and everything, that there was going to be a, um, was going to be a memorial established for the plane that my character went down in St Stick 66 wow. over Normandy. And uh, I went to this, uh, just on my own bat, at my own cost, I went to this um, uh, memorial service in a small church in a little town in France called bouzeville en plain And afterwards, uh, these paratroopers came, a squad of paratroopers came, and uh, they raised the flag and they unveiled this memorial, which was beautiful. And then this Belgian company called um, uh, the Force Landing Association, an amateur company, uh, took me into a field and told me this is where the plane burned for two weeks. Uh, and there's a small wow. patch of grass, or a small patch of, sort of darkness that right. grass still doesn't grow on in one corner um, since that day. Wow. And they showed me um, something they'd found with their metal detectors. It was a ring. And my character's name was Thomas Meehan, and the initials TM were inscribed on the inside Chills. of the ring, and they showed it to me. And I was like, I'm holding this guy's ring in my hand. That's what it meant to everybody. We were playing real people who really lived, really died as heroes, and um, that like really brought it home. By the way, they couldn't find uh, enough family. These guys died so young that often they're they they you know the families were never really as, truly established so a lot of these personal effects go into a museum and you can see that ring in the uh, d-day museum in france i i certainly appreciate you sharing that story that's so that's so meaningful when it comes when it comes full circle and you're mm. acting a role that's based on reality 
and where people actually died. It's it's fascinating. So, uh, switching. And, and do you know? Sorry, before you, go for before it, you move on, we still meet up every year as a reunion. The cast, we still do it. Oh wow! I'd yeah. love to be a fly and, and on we, that wall. We we celebrated twenty years since it came out uh, last year. We we went to the uh, we went to the World War Two Museum in New Orleans and yeah. uh, had like a three day. Uh, celebration it was fantastic. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm a huge Damian Lewis fan. I'm a big fan of Billions, and and I know when he went through a lot personally in the last couple of years, and just good to see him come back. And I've I've heard great things about him in the industry uh, yeah. as well. So switching gears, new movie, uh, Your Lucky Day, re released about a week ago. What, what's it yeah. all about? Because I think the premise is fantastic. It, <laughs> yeah. it could be real. It could be real. <laughs> it could be real. It's like, well, I suppose the tagline is what we do do for 156 million dollars. Um, but yeah, that the the uh, a lot. the pitch is basically, <laughs> yeah, not uh, much. The pitch is basically, um, you know, a guy wins a, a 156 million dollar lottery ticket in the store. There's a handful of people in the store. One of them decides to, you know, he's a small time drug dealer that he's going to take. Uh, he's going to take it. But there's a young cop in the bathroom, and he comes out, and a firefight. Uh, a firefight happens. Somebody dies. Actually, a couple of people get hit, and it's like, what do we do now? Do we lock the doors and try to figure this out between us? Do we call the cops? Do we do the right thing, or or do we make a deal? So it's kind of interesting. You, you'd hope that you would do the right thing in that situation, but you don't course. know. Well. Yeah, you I mean, if you, you, know, you don't know what you would changes, do. Right? Every, everything, well, everything changes, right? Everything changes when you've got a gun pointed at you, right? and 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 a shit ton of money in front of you. A lot, a yeah. lot could change there. Um, yeah. How do you, how do you feel about the finished product and and people's reception to it? Well, I, I'm absolutely overjoyed because um, you know with something like that, it was it was very low budget. Uh, somebody made a joke actually. Luke Barnett, one of the producers, made a joke that um, that we were in the Apple charts. I think we were at, at eight. And we were just ahead, just behind Oppenheimer, and he said that we're we're coming for you Let's on the do it. Uh, on the same on the same budget you had for your coffee on Oppenheimer. <laughs> we made uh, our movie, so it's 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 that kind of it's it's it was low budget. Uh, but Dan Brown, this director, I watched his short films uh, before I committed to doing it because it, it was no no money or anything. Mm -hmm. This was a passion thing, and it was so good. Like he's so talented. I knew there was going to be. I knew something good would come of it, but I had no idea it was going to turn out as well as it did. And it's been playing to packed houses over the weekend in the Alamo Draft House theaters all over the country. And now it's on Apple and you can watch it yep. video on demand on any of them. And it's doing really well. So, yeah. And I'm a terrible I'm a terrible journalist because we're actually not watching it until tomorrow night. But I said, you know what? That's I've okay. watched enough of the trailers to get it. That's on my Friday night TV. But let's let's awesome. let's talk about the lead in the film, the late uh, Angus Cloud. Um, yeah. Best known for his role in, in Euphoria. We're getting a bunch of comments here in the in, in the notes, but a bunch of comments uh, from the crowd here. Um, what was it like working with him? Tell, tell us tell us about your experience. Tell us some fun fun thoughts. Well, he's just he was just the the, the sweetest kid, like um, just unbelievably sweet. I didn't know what to expect after watching. I was a fan of Euphoria, I still am. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it's, it was a great show, and uh, I thought he was always fantastic in it. And you had a feeling that he was right on the edge of real stardom, you know, because he had something about him, didn't he? He had this, uh, you know, what would the French say? Je ne sais quoi. Yeah. Je ne sais quoi. The, See, I could do the that. It thing. Yeah, there you go. Uh, <laughs> no, he had, the, he had this X factor, right? Um, and he also, when you meet him, you kind of go, oh, I get it now. He's also really, really sweet. So he's incredibly talented. His stars on the rise, and he's a lovely, kind human being. So uh, that makes it all the more tragic, obviously. But you know, the first conversation I had with him, he's like, "Oh, you're Irish." He was like, "Oh, I've got family in Balbriggan and Offaly, and I can't wait to go back to Ireland. I'd love to go back and live there one day." And he really meant it, you know. And he really did have real you know a lot of people go a lot of irish americans go oh yeah ireland you know i've got no real family my grandmother was from there or you know i have to go there one day but this guy had angus had real uh real connections there and um he really set the tone for the work he he, he made it real he made it natural he re kept the stakes high um he I really you know it was it was uh he was definitely number one on on that call sheet for you know actually the movie takes a funny turn, so I don't want to give anything away. We're not going to give it away. Um, 
No, but he's he's just it, the whole thing is just tragic, Adam. What can I say? Like so, it's, it's needless and tragic. As someone who yourself has embraced sobriety, were, were there any were there any signs? Did you see things? Were, were there indicators that things something was wrong at that time? Not not really. I mean, I, I've met you know you meet emotionally fragile people, and you don't think you don't think they're going to end up um not surviving uh sometimes it's you know sometimes it comes down to anything you know like just luck or fate or um you know things like that but but um i suppose there was something uh emotionally fragile about him if you really looked into his eyes and the way he talked and he was a very gentle sensitive person you know and this the gentle sensitive souls who seem to be um, more susceptible to uh, to addiction and um, and uh, you know dealing with real challenges in their lives. So um, I don't know the full. There's there's uh, out of respect for his family, of course, who, of course, who um, who have not fully decided on the cause of death. Um, I'm not going to posit on that. Or I'm not going to you well, know take any swipes, but it's, but it's de- certainly drug related. Yeah. So with, with, with that being said, you know, what, what, what advice would you give to anyone? I mean, young, young, act, let's talk about the, the folks in the acting industry, which is incredibly stressful uh, to begin with. Plus the, the whole process of, of getting into a character, especially if you're a method actor and you're really deep in it too. And you're also struggling with whether it be substance abuse or mental health issues. I mean, what could allies do to keep an eye on, on their friends and family? Well, look, I mean, um, I think we have to kind of rewind this and go back to real basics, you know, um, and obviously this is something we're, we're trying to do with Movember, right? Um, there, there's the, the, the main thrust of the message is to, is to communicate, is to start talking, is to reach out, is to start the process of processing, you know, to get this stuff mm-hmm. moving, to talk about real things, to develop deeper relationships, um, uh, do you want to get into the November stuff now? Yeah, let's 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 get it. Let's get into November. And for folks that uh, you were leading the transition in there, I was going with it. I was yeah, lub- lubing yeah. it up. Uh, first and foremost, uh, since 2015, that's when I joined November, and I'll talk about my affiliation uh, in a moment and my reason behind Me too. November 2015. Yeah. 2015. So for folks out there who are not familiar, please, as one of the core brand ambassadors, tell everyone what November is all about, what the movement is. Well. Uh, like I said, I've been part of it since 2015. It's the leading global charity changing the face of men's health. Um, I'm I'm passionate about the organization's mission and message. Um, I think the aspect of it I'm most passionate about is that uh, is, you know, look, four, four out of five suicides are are men, and every suicide is a tragedy that affects uh, hundreds of people, families, communities around them, um, and. I think November November does a great job around uh, mental health and suicide prevention. Uh, they let guys know that being vulnerable is uh, is a superpower, and becoming a man of more words can save lives. So, um, so I try to raise awareness every year. I try to encourage people to donate at November.com, become a Mo Bro, become a Mo Sister. Uh, it's what the uh, mustache is all about. It creates a talking point and and. Uh, you know, it gets people to, um, this is, this is really about trying to save lives and, Absolutely. Um, and get the process <clears throat> sort of moving the communication, get guys to start talking about and, their bodies and their minds. Right. And, and correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, it started primarily focused on, on, on cancer, right. It started on men's health issues yeah. and, it, and then it with, with mental health. And, um, I'll talk about my, my journey here in a moment. Let's see if I could switch the screen here. Uh, nope, I can't do that there. Let's do, let's do it this way behind me. You can't really see it too well. It's not really showing. I don't know why that's not working. Uh, congratulations. Yes, Lynn congratulations. This is uh, my dad's uh, remission certificate in 2015 oh. diagnosed with prostate cancer, went through um, the treatment and uh, is been in remission since uh, 2015. So uh, this was a cause that was near and dear to me, something that mm-hmm. I knew I needed to participate in. First for myself, uh, someone who's getting older, has kids, and I need to just Tell all my friends out there, I get get screened, get checked, get everything every year, colon cancer, prostate cancer, get a full panel of checks. Don't neglect your body, not for you, but for your family. 
Like, don't yeah. you want to be here in your best health for your kids and the people that love you and your friends and family once a year? And now yeah. they have such less invasive checks. I, I did the I did the screen uh, last week at my annual physical. It's a blood test. They don't even need to do the uh, the old how you doing. Really? I, I keep going for the old how you doing. I mean, I yes, you, people pay extra, but that's I'm old school. <laughs> Uh, Jason, you don't have to go four times a year for that. It's, it's okay. It's, it's, I gotta, I gotta wrap this up. I got another appointment coming up here in a few minutes. Uh, I, I, I <laughs> exactly. Jason, um, you also talk about, uh, your self-care routine. Let's talk a little bit about your self-care. Uh, yes. And by the way, just, just to add on to that, uh, 2015 was also that the, the previous year I lost my, um, stepfather to stomach cancer. So I think that's part of it too. So I, I do. Uh, completely hear you on that um and with my own journey um and i think that's why november speaks to me so much it's like obviously there's the cancer part but also the the mental health part um yeah i i look i uh i i'm irish so i drank a lot and um uh i was brought up sort of irish catholic um and uh and, and we all kind of we all kind of drank a lot uh all my friends um you know everyone i it's knew what, it's it what was, you did growing up yeah it's what we did and uh <clears throat> but by the age of my father got sober when i was at 17. uh obviously never forget that and then uh i decided i needed help at the age of 22 and my father brought me to my uh, my first meeting um and and that kind of began this journey you know that i've been on ever since and uh, obviously it saved my life and um i you know opened the door to all kinds of um uh ways techniques methods practices that uh i would later employ kind of um by fusing them all together into a sort of a daily routine that continues to make my life better and happier and more joyful and so that's really what it is. It's a journey, you know. It's a journey. It's not a destination, but it's, <laughs> but it's, but it's, uh, it's something I couldn't have done if I'd kept drinking and using, you know. Well, kudos to you. And I'm curious. You said your your dad sobered up when you were 17. Yeah. How much of that of his like his personality and who he was changed for the better and for the worse? I'm always curious too because some people are happy drunks. Some people are angry drunks. I mean, what was what, what was that like? If you don't mind sharing a a, a bit of personal, if you don't mind. Yeah, no, he <clears throat> he was very quiet for the first year, um, and uh, while he did exactly that, sobered up, and then uh, then he changed profoundly. And you know, he he meditates every day, wow. twice a day for the last oh god, I don't know, thirty years, maybe twenty five years. Um, so he's become a huge uh benign force in my life you know That's fantastic. Um, and we didn't always get along and and we still have moments now because we're both human but but you know I, it's given me the opportunity to have this amazing sort of um relationship with, with him that i never thought i would have because when i was in college and drinking man, like, all we did was fight you know all we did was fight and it was it was it was making me miserable but um but through sobriety we have this connection now which is uh, which is amazing that's that's incredible and one of the big parts of of sobriety obviously the big part is saying no is saying no and saying no to temptation saying no to uh other other pressures that are out there um how, how did you learn the power of saying no uh well it's uh i suppose sure it's I'm a lot of trial and error yeah but i'm not big on willpower adam like I, I i don't i don't have it you know and i i know on your podcast you have a lot of extremely successful people who who seem to have just willed and manifested success into their lives and i really admire that because i i don't have much of that um yeah. but uh, so i had to call on sort of another power you know i i have a i have a higher power in my life who i'm able to hand stuff over to um anything I can't handle, I just let it go and hand it over. And through that, um, kind of strangely, ironically, um, I do have some power, you know, so it's uh, until I found that I kind of struggled and not everyone can find that, you know, and, and I'm not, 
um, listen, I'm, I'm a spiritual person. I'm not a particularly religious person. What do they say? Um, religion is for people who want to avoid hell and spirituality is for those who have already been there. Something like that. I like um, that one. That's that's a new one. I like that. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I don't, you know, I have no opinion on, on religion or or even God, but I just have this relationship with something inside me, my higher self, my my deeper self. Um, I think David Lynch calls it the unified field. You can go the science route, but you could also go the more spiritual route where there's something, you know, call it your soul, something that connects you to the universe. And that's that's it for me. I, I love it. And this conversation reminds me of the conversation I had with Kevin Smith, a great actor and director, uh, Kevin Smith, uh, yeah. New Jersey native Kevin Smith. And we talked yeah. about uh, one of my favorite movies of his, Dogma, starring George Carlin, George Carlin, my comedic hero as a priest. And I asked Kevin Smith, what was that interaction like with George Carlin? He said, George Carlin absolved him of religion. And I was like, whoa, okay, now we got to <laughs> get into this one. So I went down a rabbit hole of religion with Kevin Smith. And afterwards, he said he never talked about that ever on any interview. And it was like, whoa, yeah. okay. I hit I hit a nerve there. So switching gears a little bit, we only have a few minutes left. Um, let's talk about the power of no with the wow, SAG strike, way. right? You you have a hard stop at, at two, right? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'll get I'll get you there. Um, the SAG strike just ended. Uh, congratulations. First of all, talk to, for industry for people out there. Like, let, let's let's talk about your side and people like oh these these fucking actors are making all this money. What are they bitching about? Yeah, and like no no no, that's not what it's about. I'd love to hear a perspective from an actual actor in SAG. <laughs> Sure, yeah. Well, um, look, I suppose the, the number one thing that we were striking for, and I suppose the writers were striking for as well, is residuals. When uh, the writers did a deal in 2007, they kind of, uh, they kind of uh, sidebarred residuals on new media. And so SAG did the same at around the same time. And what happened was new media became everything we now know is streaming right? Uh, Netflix, Apple, Amazon, Hulu, all the things, Disney, plus everything. It's not, like it's not even the future. It's what it is. It's, this is, it's what it is. Now. It's what it is. It's like, I mean, who still has a cable sub sub subscription? I don't, but okay, you do. Like for uh, live but sports, not, but I got to get rid of it. Anyway, sorry. Not maybe not forever, but um, so the, so the, everything has changed, you know, um, everything we know about broadcast television has changed. And, and we'd kind of, kick the can down the road with that because um, we didn't really have uh, proper residuals agreed upon for anything that was new media, which was all of this. And by the way, I, I think that because of that loophole, that's exactly why it was exploited and that's exactly why we have streaming, but that's and, just a personal. Uh, right. And, and, and think about right there, all these old shows are just pumping back out on, I mean, look at suits, for example, the show was, was mediocre on back when it aired Right. Sorry. I, I watched it. Right. It's fine. <laughs> but then all of a sudden during the strike, they put it back up there. And it's almost like I, I don't know what the relationship is from a residuals, but they're pumping in. Millions of people are watching it. It's important. For yeah. So. To get paid. Yeah, exactly. So. So. So we were going to we, we were striking for residuals uh, with all the new media stuff, um, with all the streaming stuff. And then the other thing, and there was a couple other things, too. But the other big one was A.I. Right? That's what I wanted to talk. If about anything is going mm -hmm. to affect A.I., it's actors. Right. And anyone, anyone in performance. And you're around the technology of it. Like, I mean, you've been involved in productions with deep CGI and like the, the ability to deep fake, replicate voices and literally take your face and your voice and, and use technology. They could basically script the whole movie with just one minute of your time. Yeah. So, so it was all about kind of ownership, um, trying to, trying to figure out like how to give permission, how to get paid for this stuff. Um, who, who owns it, who can use it, how long can they use it for, you know, all of that, which uh, is very complicated because all of this language is being created for the first time. And right. I think the, the negotiating frontiers. committee, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. I think they did a great job, um, but there are, there's some serious um, you know, tire kicking going on right now at this moment going like, hey, are we sure we have this all buttoned up? Because we know from 2007 that the very loophole we leave is exactly what will be exploited. So. Do we have this all buttoned up? Are we really good to go on the AI thing? Because it really is something that could change everything for actors forever. So what, what was the resolution on the AI part for everyone out there who's not following note by note? Well, I mean, we're right now we're trying to ratify the contract so that we can all right. go back to work and approve it. But there are some people saying it's the AI stuff needs more work. Um, 
then there's yet more people saying if we go back, we could end up with a worse deal hmm. and we might have to go back on strike again. So um, it's not quite it's not quite over yet. I have a feeling we'll probably ratify this, but I think there's going to have to be serious consideration given to the the AI aspect for um again soon like i don't think we can let this go because we don't fully no. understand it yet so how can we fully create the guardway Great. no Guard it's rail. a tough one it's basically building you know building the airplane as you fly because the technology is moving yeah. so fast so i appreciate you sharing that perspective uh, i'm going to wrap it up here and bring it home with uh with a couple of questions but before i do share with us a quick what's one of the craziest stories you've had on set give us a quick little snippet before we uh wrap it up crazy story that's a crazy story Oh man, I'm not. I'm not very good with. I'm gonna, um, well, I'm going to give you. I'll give you some context. It could be uh, uh, okay. equipment equipment failure related. The category. The category is <laughs> equipment <laughs> failure related. Oh God. Um, okay. Uh, Maybe a wardrobe malfunction. Well, you certainly have to always be very careful of uh, of what you say because you have a, a radio mic on, right? So um, you have to be really careful. Yeah. Um, uh, what else? Um, oh God, there was a couple of moments actually. I was doing the show called Vegas with uh, uh, Dennis Quaid and Michael Chiklis. And I remember I was, that show. Yeah, yeah, and I was driving an old. Um, I love Chiklis. Uh, what, uh, the commish, the commish was excellent. Yeah. And uh, what was the yeah. dirty cop one that I love? Uh, the the, uh, the Shield, right? The, the Shield. shield. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Shield is epic television, and the commish yeah, was great too. Amazing. Oh, yeah. Chiklis? And, what's what's Chickless doing these days? That guy's great. I just had a movie, new movie come out called The Senior uh, about uh, an aging like uh, football player. He's he never stops. Chicky he's, he's he's always he's always working. Seems like a good guy. Um, Seems like he would be a good guy. Uh, he's great. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's great. Fun. <laughs> um, loves a chat and a joke. Um, so I, I was driving. Um, I was driving a pickup, uh, an old pickup truck from like 1960 when it was when it was set, and um, and we were like hightailing it out of out of uh, a house i think in a driveway and um and i had one of the actors uh taylor with me in the car and we came around and I, as i said i was like really booking it we came around the camera truck was right in front of oh, us no. and there's no way i was going to be able to stop in time and i just it was a small just like and i just passed it like by half an inch near miss and really really scary like it wasn't we didn't report it wasn't an incident but it was so close to being like a big big effing deal that you know shit like that can happen and um no matter how you allow for it on set like stuff can happen accidents can happen it's, it's so, dangerous um yeah yeah it is it is but that's i'm sorry that's that's the best like all right let's let's all right that's that's good what, what do you what do you watch it on tv these days I am watching uh, the fall of the House of Usher. On we just fi we just finished that. It is okay. So I'm good. only halfway through. Don't I'm, tell me. I'm not giving it away. I'm not giving away. And and uh, and and the other one we just finished at the miniseries, all the light we cannot see, based on the book. Yes, I want to see that too. Um, at full disclosure, Kate Kate Siegel and Mike Flanagan on Fall of House of Usher are friends of mine. So uh, uh, please, they're please, they're amazing. Please, please tell them personally that Adam said you guys did a great job. We love Adam and Aloma yes. love the show. Thank you. I appreciate that. Right. Um, let's let's bring it home here, Jason. Jason, I asked all my guests this question over 302 episodes of the show. Jason O'Mara, what is the single greatest piece of advice you've ever received that you take action on every day? Uh, can I do two? Please do 12. Okay, the first one is first one is show up. Uh, and I know it sounds really simple, but it's uh, it means uh, or you can also add suit up and show up. And it means that you have to you have to get up, you have to get dressed and you have to show up for either yourself is the most important person to show up for you and uh, everyone else in your life. So showing up on a daily basis is huge. It, 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 it compels you to make connections with people and to be there in person. Um, anytime I've been kind of, I've been, you know, my mental health hasn't been right or back when I was drinking, the last thing I wanted to do was show up. I didn't show up. I locked the doors, I pulled the curtains and I sat in darkness and I didn't want to interact. So I know when I'm isolating that I need to show up. So that's a simple one. The other one was something Harvey Keitel, uh, gave me 
Uh, I remember talking to him about how nervous I was about how the show was going to be received and the critics and um, under pressure from the network and all these people that thought I couldn't do it. And he looked me in the eye and he said, just do the work. And that stayed with me because all the other stuff is noise. Like it, all that anxiety, all of that fear is noise. It's your head. It's not, doesn't have anything to do with the facts. And all it will do is prevent you from doing the work. So just do the work. That is sound advice. And, and Jason O'Mara, last but not least, you look back on your life and you look at those hard times, struggling with sobriety, young actor coming up, trying to make a name for yourself, all those tough times. And you had to pull yourself up and harness that inner tenacity that you have, that fire. And in the same breath now, gratitude for his family, this life, this career that you've built, the relationship with your dad, with your family. What is your beacon? What is your compass? Jason O'Mara, what is your North Star in life? Well, um, I think without, without hesitation, my higher power is what guides me. And uh, in order to listen to that, I have to be quiet. So uh, daily meditation is, is the prescription for that. Um, and through quietness, I hear that, I hear that voice through silence. I hear, um, uh, that benign loving voice. So it's, it's definitely my higher power, but pretty close behind is my son, David, who I just adore. And, uh, I show up for him. He shows up for me and, um, <clears throat> he's, he's doing film school right now down awesome. in, uh, um, Chapman university down in orange at the uh, Dodge college film school. He's doing the director's program. And I'm very proud of him. Uh, so yeah, he's, he's up there too. Awesome. Well, Jason, I want to thank you so much uh, for joining me for the past hour, my audience here. Um, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Everyone out there, check out Your Lucky Day, which is out now in select theaters and digital. And please, please, please support Movember. If you see, see us dudes with the stash that don't usually have a stash, it's probably for November. And ask us about it. And you can get involved. It's not too late at Movember.com. M-O-V-E-M-B-E-R. Jason, I want to thank you. I appreciate Boom. you. I appreciate your time. For everyone else out there, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. If you love the show, leave a review rating. It goes a long way. Find out more at thepodcast.com. Remember, be good to yourself, be better to others, and catch us next week for another great episode of the podcast. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Adam. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Let me kick us off the air.